Thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to speak at this important conference. The monetary union is the result of a French wish and a German concession. The French wish was to gain power over the D-mark through the medium of a European Central Bank, which would be open to political persuasion. The German wish was to gain a European political union, an EPU, and in this Helmut Kohl showed himself to be a romantic. Politicians are inspired by images. Kohl's image was the death of his elder brother in a Luftangriff, a bombardment, shortly before the end of the Second World War. That never again, he must have thought. Better a European Germany than a German Europe. And a European political union would assure this. He was prepared to offer the D-mark, the symbol of German economic renaissance, to achieve that end. It was his concession. As Hubert Védrine, assistant to President Mitterrand and later France's foreign minister, put it, with the single currency, Kohl made the greatest concession which one could ask from a German chancellor. And indeed, if a referendum had been held on the single currency at the time in Germany, it might well have been defeated. In November 1991, Helmut Kohl said in the German parliament, Die politische Union ist das unerlässliche Gegenstück der Wirtschafts- und Währungsunion. The political union, in English, the political union is the essential counterpart to the monetary union. So we were warned. The political union had to precede the monetary union, but it didn't. It was the other way around. The monetary union was agreed at Maastricht. We are still waiting for the EPU. Shortly after the Maastricht conference, Helmut Kohl wrote that it had not been possible to satisfy all expectations, but that a political dynamic had been created which no member state would be able to resist. It has not worked out that way. The monetary union has not had an integrating effect, but a fissiparous one, as we can all now see. In order to gain acceptance for the euro, Germany insisted on the so-called Stability and Growth Pact, which sometime later was concluded in Dublin, and which laid down the five criteria which all member states would have to meet if they wanted to join the euro. First and foremost, as we now all know, of these criteria was the requirement that your annual deficit of any member state should not exceed 3%. Now, all signatories to the Stability and Growth Pact stated in a solemn declaration that they would strictly observe the criteria but that is not what happened. Germany and France were the first to flout the rules in, I think, 2003. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if a pact, a treaty, which all signatories in a solemn declaration have said they would strictly observe is broken after a few years, which European declaration or pact would thereafter have any credibility. And that, I'm afraid, also goes for the recently in Brussels concluded pact, which reaffirms the Stability and Growth Pact while also strengthening the sanctions. Spain has already said that it cannot meet those criteria, 
and uh, Francois Hollande, president of France, has now made it abundantly clear that France will not abide by the criteria either. We shall see. Helmut Kohl's European Political Union is another term for a federal union with which the Germans have so much experience because they live in one. But the EU will never become a federation in the same way that Germany, the US, Canada and Brazil are one. That is because important member states do not want it. First and foremost, of course, the UK, where a European superstate, as a European federation is called there, is rejected in horror. But also by Poland, where ministers have told me that they have not had to suffer Soviet domination for 40 years in order to be under the tutelage of Brussels. So the Czechs and the Spanish, so now also the Dutch, even though we Dutch have gone through a time in which we believed a federal state would protect smaller states against bigger ones. It is of course true that the EU has certain federal characteristics. The European Parliament, the European Commission, the European Court of Justice, and the European Council, but that is as far as it goes. So neither of the protagonists, neither Germany nor France, got what it wanted. France believed that the Maastricht Treaty represented a victory over Germany, but it still did not get a European Central Bank which would be open to political influence, since for the Germans that would be a deal breaker also for the Dutch, and the monetary union would abort. Germany did not achieve its ambition because there will never be a European Federation. Ladies and gentlemen, one never thinks hard enough. European politicians were befuddled by romantic notions of an ever closer union as the, pre pre as the preamble to the Treaty of Rome has it. Romanticism in politics is deadly dangerous. Better be realistic remembering that the best laid plan of mice and men of the gang astray, as the Scottish poet Robert Burns has said. What should have been considered at the start, but wasn't, was a difference in economic culture between the north of Europe and the Mediterranean area, led by France. Put as succinctly as possible, the north wanted solidity the Mediterranean solidarity. Back in the 60s, Johannes Witteveen, then Dutch finance minister, later director of the IMF, said, countries that form a currency union hand each other a blank check. That was forgotten. In the French vision, the discipline provided by the balance of payment should go. If economic differences between member states were to appear, the resulting imbalances would have to be jointly financed, jointly financed, or alternatively adjusted in such a way that the burden of the adjustment would be symmetrically distributed over deficit and surplus countries. In that way, the surplus countries would show solidarity with the deficit ones. Another equally pernicious difference between the North and the Mediterranean, between the North and the Mediterranean member states, was the disparity in competitiveness. Herman van Romper, chairman of the European Council, has famously said that the euro was a sleeping pill. It enabled Mediterranean countries to borrow at artificially low interest rates while neglecting structural improvements to their economics and thus to, dream, and thus to dream of a dolce far niente. Such, such were the effects of one size fits all. And I know of not a single American who has believed in the durability of the euro, and these are the reasons. 
at the time of the debate about who should be led into the monetary union and who should not, I was leader of my party, the Dutch Liberal Party. I was opposed to membership of Italy because it was obvious that it did not satisfy the criteria. Our finance minister, Gerrit Zom, agreed with me. Consequently, he was called Il Duro or Il Perfido when in Rome he insisted on observance of the criteria. For my part, I went to Frankfurt to meet Mr. Tietmeyer, who was then president of the Bundesbank, to get him to oppose Italian entry into the Eurozone, to no avail. Lieber Herr Bolkerstein, he said, Sie sind Politiker, ich bin nur Beamte. In other words, would I do the dirty work? Of course, he could do li little else as his boss, the Bundeskanzler Helmut Kohl, had already decided that Italy would join. Italian membership of the Eurozone had one disastrous consequence. Greece was also accepted as a member, not in spite of having lied about its statistics, which it had, but because the European Council felt that it could not withhold from Greece what it had granted Italy. The Germans called this the Fluch der Bösen Tat. You do something wrong and it keeps pursuing you. And so we are now faced with a credit crisis. According to some, the crisis has been caused by bankers. That is not so. I do not deny that some, perhaps many bankers, have misbehaved by the origin lies in the US and the cause was wrong government policy. And I want to mention three factors. Firstly, the government's deficit, which was to a large extent financed by the Chinese. That meant that some of the poorest people on earth paid to keep some of the wealthiest consumers in clover. Secondly, the policy of the Fed, which kept the interest rate artificially low at 1%, where it should have been around 4%. These two factors caused an excess of liquidity. Thirdly, the legislation which asked bankers to extend loans to, per to people to purchase houses, even though they were not credit worthy. It is true that some bankers took advantage of gullible customers, but it was the government that had tied them to the bacon. We Europeans are now indeed in a pretty pickle. The order of the day is that the governments should reduce expenditure and save money in order to meet the 3% criterion. But one of the lessons, I think, of the 30s is that reducing expenditure in a time of crisis prolongs the depression. Of course, the present situation is not like the 30s. For one thing, we now have systems of social security which cushion the effects of unemployment. But these automatic stabilizers also mean increased government expenditure, which does partly offset the attempt to save. The Spanish government, as I said earlier, has begged to be excused for not applying the 3% rule, and France, as we now all know, is worse. The Greek government makes promises but cannot keep them because of its weakness. When I was a member of the European Commission, that is to say before November 2004, the Commission granted Greece 150 million euro to set up a land registry. The last time I informed that it still did not exist. And its economy, the Greek economy, is shot through with corporatist arrangements. So uh, I regret to say that it is difficult to see how Greece can remain a member of the monetary union. I think the best thing for Greece, and I've said so for a number of years now, I think the best thing for Greece would be to leave it, perhaps to return later once it has cleaned up its act. No doubt that would be a very messy affair. But what is the point of sending Troika missions to Athens every so often, only to find out that once again the Greek government has not done what it has promised. 
One thing we certainly should not do is to set up so-called euro bonds. These would mean that all member states would pool their debts, which would then be financed by these bonds at, a, at an agreed, at, at an average rate of interest. It would be a disastrous plan. For one thing, it would make the Netherlands pay a much higher rate of interest than is now the case. My last calculation showed the burden of interest to go up by 7 billion euro each year. Secondly, and worse, the euro bonds would stand as a veil between the deficit countries and the markets, just as the euro did. But these deficit countries should respond more to the market, not less. Belgium's former Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt is an adept, is an adept of that plan, but that, I suspect, is because he wants to abolish the nation state, which is absurd. In more general terms, ladies and gentlemen, all mutualization dilutes responsibility, which is the opposite of what should happen. Will the euro area break up? Rather, what sort of euro will it in future be? Will it show solidity, as Germany and my own country wants? Or will it mean solidarity, which means other people's money? The Germans do not want euro bonds, nor do they want a transfer union, which would mean a permanent flow of money from north to south, in the way of the solely subventions which go or which went from west to east Germany. They resist a fiscal union which would force us to imitate France's high tax and spend economy. Thanks, I should say, to the Constitutional Court at Karlsruhe, which, if I understand it correctly, which has made further transfers of sovereignty to Brussels subject to parliamentary approval. Ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you of the history of your country, of this country. Italy was constituted in 1870. The lira became its national currency. The lira was designed for the north and too strong for the south. The North has compensated for that through the Casa per il Mezzogiorno. That transfer union continues, I believe, until today. But what has it done to improve the economic situation of the South? Ladies and gentlemen, let me end on this sad note. The monetary union has failed. It stops the valuations which the deficit countries need. Instead of being a zone of monetary stability, it is a source of unrest. As long as the north and the south of Europe are bound together, we shall never get out of the hole that we've dug for ourselves. And I thank you for your attention.